Shalom Chavrim. It is uh, an honor and a privilege to get to come to you and speak with you again. And uh, just before we get started on tonight's message, and uh, if you're watching on Word Broadcasting Network, this may be a several part message, so be sure to follow it each day. I'm not sure at the time of making this recording how many parts it is, but I'm sure we'll have it listed on the film for you. I uh, want to just speak to the, you guys, especially if you're tuning in on Word Broadcasting Network. We are very passionate and uh, very concerned about the way we use the funds that God is so kind to, to have sent to us by the listeners. Uh, many, most of the support that we get comes from our YouTube channel. And we started with Word Broadcasting Network here uh, just at the beginning of September of 2013. And we just want to know if this is being a blessing to you. We realize that Word Broadcasting Net Network uh, has a potential broadcasting of into 65 million homes. Now, we realize the reality of that, not 65 million viewers are going to be watching. However, we know that when people do hear about it, the word begins to get spread. The people enjoy the message or they like this particular type of programming. And we would really be so grateful if you would take the time, write us at IsraelReturns at AOL.com. That's our email address. Now, if you don't happen to have a computer and you're watching this via satellite on channel 129, and that's, uh, that's uh, Satellite TV, I think that's Glory Star is where Word Broadcasting Network uh, broadcasts, and you're, you're catching us on your television set. You can write us at 12537 Gemstone Court, Fort Myers, Florida, and that's 33913. At the end of the broadcast, you'll see the, uh, the address once again. Uh, as well, if you happen to catch this on YouTube and uh, you would like to drop us a line as well, we really appreciate it. Uh, just to know, is this a blessing to you? And you know, if you have any comments or anything that we could do or something you would like to hear about, We'll certainly pray about it and try to try to do some, get get that type of programming out there to you. Let's go right into the message here. I'm actually going to be speaking to you about the the uh, premise of the book Yamsuf, the book that I that I the last book I wrote. Those of you that may not know that I actually write books, we've written two. Israel, are they still God's people? Was the first book I wrote. Second book is um, uh, Yamsuf, Israel's final exodus and. By God's grace, I've actually started on a third book, and this one here is What Would Moses Say? Um, really wanting to take and, and go deep into the Torah and how it reflects who the Messiah really is in a way that hopefully it will cause my own people, the Jewish people, to recognize that Yeshua is Mashiach. Uh, those of you that are watching that don't know, sometimes people think they say, well, you know, Steve is, is a Messianic rabbi. Uh, I'm your brother. Uh, I know I get called rabbi a lot, and that's all right. That's what people want to call me there. Uh, I'm called messianic a lot, and I guess if you're Jewish and you believe that Yeshua is Mashiach, in that regard, yes. Uh, I know there's a lot of people in the messianic movement, and I, and I certainly love them, and God bless them, but I am focused on the identity of Mashiach, and my people recognize in that. Uh, I do wear a kippah or a yarmulke, whichever you prefer to call that, uh, I do wear one for the sake of my people. However, I am a Karite Jew by belief, which means I subscribe to what the Torah teaches, the Tanakh, uh, and, and not as much as what the Talmud or the Midrash or the Mishnah. Uh, although I am familiar with the, the books as well, the Talmud, both the Babylonian and the Jerusalem Talmud, which was really not written in Jerusalem. Uh, but anyway, uh, but I realize the inconsistencies that the rabbis have in there. And, but it's still, it's interesting to read because it gives us an insight on what the thinking is in Judaism as the time has come down. So uh, I, I think there's some value to these books, although I do not place anything above the Bible. And by the way, for those Christians that think that Jews do place the Talmud uh, equal to or above uh, the Torah or the Tanakh, that is not true. It is a, a misunderstanding. And uh, normally though, Jews will never tell you that. Although rabbis do not do that. They, they do hold it in high regard though. That is true. They hold it in high regard. But they do know that the Tanakh is the absolute word of God. 
anyway, uh, and of course I believe that the uh, the uh, Bereshit Chadasha, which is the New Testament, is also the Word of God. Uh, love to get into a debate with Tobias Singer and uh, or Rabbi Mitzvahi about this one. Uh, they, they have not crossed my path yet. I know they've tried to debate some Christian uh, scholars out there and have buried the Christian scholars, but I would certainly welcome their debate as well. Uh, I, I think maybe by God's grace, it might convince them that who the Mashiach really is. Uh, let's take, if you're following in your Bible, in the Christian Bible, Jeremiah 23, uh, there's a little bit different wording in the Tanakh that I'm using than, than the King James, but just bear with me, uh, it'll be quite all right. Uh, you'll hear me use the word Hashem, for the divine name of God, and, and the King James is capital L-O-R-D, all caps, letting you know it's God's divine name. Uh, I do refrain from saying the divine name because the scripture does say in the commandments, take not the Lord thy God's name in vain. And for the honor and for the sake of my people that are very passionate about that, uh, I do honor that. And uh, that's why we don't try to say one of the different types of forms of pronouncing it. Now, I know that my good friend Nehemiah Gordon believes that God has revealed to him that by some of the bowels that were found in the in the Torah when he was doing Torah studies at the University in Jerusalem. Uh, but I'm waiting for God. I do believe that it's coming though, very soon, that the divine name and his pr pronunciation of Hashem's divine name is coming. I do believe that. Uh, so anyway, in uh, Yeremiah, uh, Kach Gimel, and uh, starting in verse Zayim, uh, let's read here. Lachin hene yamim, and I will read this to you in English, by the way. So if you give me just one second here as I read to my brethren. Lachin hene yamim, ba'im naun Adonai velo ramru od chai Adonai ashach hela et bnei Yisrael mi'eretz Mitzrayim. Ki im chai Adonai ashach hela ve'ashach habi, excuse me, habi et zera ba'it Yisrael mi'eretz sefonach. U umikol umikol ha'aratzot ashach hi chedi. Excuse me, he the Khatim Sham Veshvu al Adamatam. Okay, now we were talking this I'm just going to read directly, so I'm not going to translate it literally for you, but I will speak to you about some of the words in here so you understand a little bit better. Therefore, behold, the days are coming. Uh, the word of Hashem, when people will no longer swear as Hashem lives, who brought the children of Israel up from the land of Egypt, but rather as Hashem lives, who brought up and brought back the offspring of the house of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands wherein he had dispersed them, and they will dwell in their own land. Now, let's just look at this back in the Hebrew for a couple of little points here that I want to bring out to you. Lachen chenei yomim. Okay, uh, behold uh, the days, of, or for behold, or for lachen is for yes, or therefore, uh, is how you would translate that. Chenei yomim, the days... Ba'im are coming, Na'um Adonai, Velo Ve'yomu Od Chai Adonai Asha. When you say Chai Adonai, the Lord liveth, or the Lord that lives. Um, so we would be saying, For behold, the Lord lives. Asha Ha'ela Et B'nei Yisrael, that the children of Israel, the, the, no longer that the Lord lives. That, that brought out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. Ma'aras Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is Egypt. Ki im chay Adonai ashal. But, or rather, we will say, uh, rather we will say, the Lord lives, ashal ha'elah, ashal habi et zara, that the seed by Israel, the seed of the house of Israel, me'eretz, um, will come up, me'eretz tzifunach, from the land of the north, Mikol, now it's the second one, and excuse me, U, U Mikol, and from all our thought, from all the lands, Asha uh, Hidamatim, where they had been driven, Sham Veshvu, they will return Al Adamat Adamatam. And the word Adamatam is the ground or the earth. The same word that God used when he made the name of Adam from Adamat from the ground is used in this case here. Now this is what got me, or 
Let me, let me just kind of rehearse to you the story that happened that inspired the book of Yom Suf. Uh, I've spoke about this before in an interview with Chuck Missler and uh, in other places, maybe on YouTube. But a lot of people that come along, they've never heard this. And this is the first time. Uh, back in 2008, there was a, a Holocaust movie that came out that was really extraordinary in, in the filming. Uh, Ed Zwick was the director of this. It starred uh, uh, Daniel Craig as a, as a great her a heroine, a, a Jewish heroine um, by the name of Tuvia Bielski, uh, which I am uh, friends with uh, Tuvia's oldest son, Michael Bielski, uh, and his family, precious family there. And uh, Liev Schreiber, who plays Tuvia's brother uh, in the movie as well. And um, uh, of course, Tuvia had more than one brother. He actually had two other brothers as well. Uh, different actors that played their, their parts as well. But these are the two main characters that you see in the movie as far as uh, the well-known characters in the movie. And we were watching this film, me and my wife. Uh, we went and seen it at the theater. Um, I, we had, I had already met Michael Bielski. It's kind of a coincidence there before God revealed this story to me. And, uh, and we had become, become friends uh, when we met. Had, had no idea who he was, uh, other than I had seen the movie, and when I was in his home one day, I was doing a delivery there, I saw a picture of his father and mother. Uh, and when I saw the photo, I'm like, gosh, I know this family. Where do I know this family from? And of course, through the chat and everything, I found out that this was uh, his family, that the movie had been made of. We had seen the movie maybe a year or so earlier, and... After seeing this movie again, I, I went home and I, or excuse me, after meeting uh, Michael Bielski, I went home, told my wife about meeting him, and we became uh, friends there. Uh, and I said, why don't we rent the movie and show it to your father? Her father lived here in World War II, and uh, he was in Hungary. Her father is half Jewish as well, through his mother's uh, side of the family. And so I rented the movie, brought it home, and we were playing it. Uh, we have a not considered big anymore, but I think like a 48-inch screen TV we were watching this on. And the movie gets to an interesting point. Uh, and when it does, the Bielski family, or excuse me, the Bielski uh, Ultriad, the Ultriad is a group of Jews. Um, let me give you a little, little background on the story so it helps you understand before I go right into telling you what happens here. Uh, Tuvia Bielski, during... Uh, World War II, lived in a country called Belarusia. Uh, Belarusia, or Belarus as it was known, is a small country that has been fought over for many, many hundreds of years there. In fact, the Jews that lived in this region here had been there for nearly 400 years. It had changed hands under rulers multiple times. And, um, the, and every time it would change hands, it was always someone that was anti-Semitic, whether the Russians had it, the Poles had it, uh, the Germans had it, uh, whoever had it at that time were very anti-Semitic. When the Germans were in World War II and they had already defeated uh, so many of the countries around there, they set their sights on Moscow. Well, Belarus is like a little hub right there on the way to Moscow. And it was nothing to overrun the country. Uh, it was under uh, Russian control at the time, uh, after, the, uh, after one of the wars previous to that. It was, so it was under Russian control. And the, so the Germans invaded, and they were able to defeat the Russians very quickly. Uh, and so they, the, the whole idea was to use Belarus as a launching pad for their attack on Moscow. This was what was going on. Even though they had, Hitler had already signed a peace agreement with Russia that they would not attack, that they would you know, basically be allies. Uh, but when they invaded Belarus, Russia knew then their problems were coming. The largest massacre of Jews during the entire war happened in Belarus, in this country here. Um, the Novogrudic, one of the major cities there, one of the metropolises there, many Jews lived in this part, part of the country. The Bielskis lived in the countryside. Um, 
But Novogrudik was a major city there in Belarus, and when the in a huge Jewish population, when the Germans invaded, Hitler began immediately with the order of annihilating the Jews in this area, and I forget the exact number, but tens of thousands of Jews were killed. Um, the Bielski brothers managed to escape into the wilderness. Uh, the Nelabak forest was one of the, was the main largest forest there that many of the Jews escaped to. And in the beginning, Tuvia and his brother did not go to the Nelabak forest. They went later in the story. Uh, but they escaped to the forest near where they lived out in the country. And, uh, and they hid there until they could regroup and try to figure out what to do. In the course of this whole action, if you watch the movie, you find out that uh, the Bielski brothers' family was murdered by the Germans. Uh, his parents were killed. Um, you know, they were seeing their people slaughtered. And it was very difficult for Tuvia and for his brother Zeus and the soil. That, those are his brothers there, as well as uh, his younger brother Jacob. Uh, it was very difficult for them to watch the massacre of their of their kindred, their 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 cousins, their aunts, their uncles, and uh, and these were not men to lightly take this type of treatment at all. They, Tuvia was very well known in the community he lived in as a man that would stand his ground and would fight at the drop of a hat. You pushed him, he would fight. And um, so when, when the Germans had invaded, they escaped to the, to the woods. But immediately, Tuvia took on a nature totally different from Zeus or a soil. Uh, Zeus was more of the aggressor. Now, in the movie, they portray Zeus as the uh, next in line as far as age of his brother. But I believe it was a soil that was the second in line of the age. And then came uh, uh, Zeus. And of course, I had one other brother as well that uh, lived in the city, uh, who was uh, uh, more more into into education, etc. But the movie mainly focuses on on Zeus of soil and uh, and of course Tuvia. Now, as as we find as as this as the invasion is going on and the Germans are killing off their family members and stuff, Tuvia begins to have that passion to rescue. The Jews. Now he wasn't. He didn't play around. He would kill as well, as far as the Germans, and there. And they did want to to make a partisan group that would go back and and take retribution for you know or not retribution you know take take vengeance I should say not retribution but take vengeance for the death of Jews. And they did do this. They they built an incredible partisan group as well. But whereas Zeus was more into wanting to just fight the Germans with anything and everything they had, Tuvia took on that nature of a rescuer. He was considered to be their modern-day Moses. And, uh, and, and Ed Zwick does a beautiful job portraying that rescuer that was in him. And, and in fact, it's one of the things that the critics really caused the movie to have a, a poor review, is they said he was too religious in it. And yet, Tuvia was not an Orthodox Jew. Uh, he did believe in keeping the, the, the basic laws of Judaism. He, his father, when he was a younger man, um, when he could afford to do it, would send him to shul, to where he could learn. And uh, so he was, he was aware of the customs. His family kept the traditions uh, of, of, of the Passover, of um, the, the holidays, whether it be Yom Kippur, Yom Sukkot, uh, you know, the, the, uh, I'm trying to think of how you say these in English, but uh, uh, the Day of Atonement, uh, the Day of Ta uh, Feast of Tabernacles, uh, you know, uh, Rosh Hashanah, all the holidays, they, they, they always observed those. They were observant Jews as far as that, but they lived in a rural area. So it was a little different than living in the city where there was, there was always a place to be able to go. There was no synagogue in the, in the area that they lived in. But as Tuvia would, would live there in the, the wilderness there, he began to rescue as many Jews as he could, did not care if they were family or not. If they were a Jew, if they were an old woman, or if they were a child, an old man, that's all that mattered to him, if they were Jews. 
And as Michael Bielski once said, his father would, would rather rescue one Jew than kill a hundred Germans. And just the passion he had for Jewish life was incredible. As I began to, as, as me and my wife though this evening were, was, was watching this movie and the events play out and we see how he would rescue them, the struggles that he had in feeding such a large number of people, at the point that he finally got when the Germans were so frustrated with this particular, particular otriad of, of Jews, the partisans that they had, the Russians ordered I want to say it was written in, in, in one of the books there, uh, called the book called Defiance uh, by Nahamatek. I want to say that they, she actually recorded they took 40,000 German soldiers, invaded the Nalabak forest, which is where he had moved to by then. They had moved around several times, kind of like the story of Moses when the children of Israel are on their exodus. Moses had them moving about several times, making camps as they worked their way to um, Mount Sinai out in the wilderness. And so Tuvia had done the same thing. He was moving them around, trying to, to, to keep them away from the Germans and knowing where they were at, that their position would not be given away. And, um, and so he moved about as well. And the Germans were always trying to find them, just as the Egyptians were intent on finding the children of Israel. We get to this one particular scene. The movie doesn't quite give you the actual facts, because you have to remember, a movie is based on a true story, but there's some sensationalism in there in order to bring out the, the, um, the premise of the movie, we might say, to really to bring out the premise of the story. And so they show that they're in a skirmish with the Germans, which they, they were in a skirmish with the Germans, trying to keep them back, but the, the German uh, forces that, that, were, that were pressing forward to where the camp was was far too great for uh, such a small partisan group to stop them. Uh, and so there were two of Tuvia's comrades that were there that mentioned to him, one had been a surveyor of this forest uh, before the war, and he said there is an island in the middle of the swamp in the Nalabak Forest. And he said, if we can get to this island, I don't believe the Germans would ever follow us there. Suddenly, on the screen, appears about what you're fixing to see. An incredible sight. A swamp that was just unbelievable in size. And when I saw this swamp that was right there before my eyes, I could not I could not contain the inspiration that I felt from this. I leaped to my feet. I grabbed the remote and I hit pause on the channel. And I said to my wife, this is what Moses was talking about. When I saw this scene, the inspiration that come upon me was just incredible. Everything that had been in my mind, I had wondered myself, the debate for the word Yamsuk that we find in Exodus in, in, in several places in the Bible, uh, I knew from Hebrew that Moses never called this a Red Sea. I knew the debate of why it got the name Red Sea. I knew that you know, there were all different kinds of debates for that, that maybe they actually crossed a, a swampy area. I knew that, uh, well, the word reed in, 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 the, uh, in one language was kind of close to the word red, or the reeds were, that they expected in that region were kind of reddish, so they ended up translating it Red Sea. Uh, just a number of debates, and I go through most of these debates in the book Yom Suf. But never, never did it occur to me that this was actually prophetic from the mouth of Moses himself. And I don't believe that Moses knew it either. Chuck Nissler points that out in the interview I did with him. He said, I don't believe that he was aware of what he was saying. But I, I looked at that, and my wife, having no idea what I meant when I said, this is what Moses was talking about, 
I had to step back and then explain to her what was going on. There is a man by the name of Ronald Wyatt. I began to tell her that I heard a chariot wheel on the Gulf of Aqaba. It's on the cover of the book. Uh, his his uh, late wife, uh, Mary, Mary Nell uh, Wyatt, uh, now married to, uh, to a precious man, Brother Lee. Uh, so her name is actually Mary, Mary Neal Wyatt Lee. Um, and, and Brother Lee also has is, is been a very proud supporter of Ron's work down through the years. But Mary Neal um, was kind enough to allow us to use the picture that Ron had taken of this gilded chariot wheel on the cover of the book, Yom Suf. And I'm certainly indebted to this sister for, for, for her kindness. I don't think that Mary Neal had ever given permission before to use the picture uh, like this, but she was kind enough to allow us to use that. I knew, though, that that discovery had been made. I knew from a documentary called The Exodus Revealed about the story uh, where a, a, a Swedish lady by the name of Vivka Pontian, who I have had the privilege to become a good friend of, discovered chariot wheels on the Saudi side. And, uh, of course, the main focus that I knew about when, I be, when this God first revealed this to me was the Exodus Revealed documentary with Dr. Leonard Moeller. Uh, I did not know the behind the scenes. I did not know how Dr. Moeller had come to his work, how he had gotten excited and involved in this as well. I know he later wrote a book called The Exodus Case, uh, which some people term as the encyclopedia on the Exodus. Uh, I haven't actually read the book yet, but... Um, but I knew that Ron Wyatt uh, had made a remarkable discovery. I also was aware that there were people that didn't agree with a lot of his findings. They seemed to be too sensational. Uh, many people had said that his work had been debunked on the Red Sea crossing. Uh, even when I interviewed with Chuck Missler, we talked about that very issue. But as we discussed it, even Chuck became more um, supportive of the idea that Nueva Beach in Egypt, modern day Egypt, was the actual crossing point for the Red Sea Crossing. Thank you for watching this broadcast. If you would like to be a part of this ministry, you can send your tax free gift to Danoon Institute at 12537 Gemstone Crescent, Fort Myers, Florida 33913, or you can give securely online at www.israelreturns.com. For more resources, visit our website again at www.israelreturns.com. Also, please visit our YouTube channel, Ben Denoon. We would like to thank some of our valued friends for making this broadcast possible. Thank you for being with us. We trust that tonight's program has been a blessing.